All right. So last time, yeah, we finished up talking about lists and how lists, when you say something like my list, which is a list, but it's not, right? It's actually a reference to a list. If I have something that gets me to a list, and then I say another list equals my list, we do not make a copy of the list. What do we make a copy of? Bingo. The information in that actual memory location. I knew what you meant. You're absolutely right. And the information in that memory location for that variable is the information that Python needs to get to where the list is. The list is over here, but my variable to store where the list is is right here. Next to the variable storing the integer 7. So, you've got to remember that. Very important. This is going to be, has anyone tried to start assignment 3? Good. The, the case here, this whole thing with lists and aliasing will be a giant pain in the ass for your assignment three, but that's the point of assignment three. Assignment three has gave, has anyone before taken this class heard of assignment three? I've heard of it. You've heard of it, a couple of people. So it's not nearly as bad as everyone would say it is. So assignment three is specifically designed for a couple of things. It's designed for you to wrap your head around lists, which is difficult. No, it's not difficult. That's not what I should say. It's, it's different than what you're used to, right? Because it's dealing with this whole aliasing thing. So you've got to make sure you're careful. <laughs> the other thing it's designed for is figuring out how to debug. Because at this point, the debugging you've been doing, raise your hand if you've been debugging your code. Put up your hand. I hate to tell you, the debugging you've been doing so far has been easy debugging. The problems that you're running into aren't going to be overly crazy. The debugging for this one is now kind of like, okay, now I'm cracking on debugging. Get used to this. This is what programming is. I hate what every TV show ever showed you. This is what programming is. Have I ever showed you this? Who here has seen a movie where it's like this? Like, oh, I'm a programmer. Oh, right. Oh, I'm so good at this. Right? Like this, this. Whoop. I don't know what I did. <laughs> no, thank you. Right? You see movies all in their programming, and it looks like no, no one does that. That's not how this works. This is not how it works. We write one line, hit run, and go, shit, it didn't work. What's wrong? That's what programming is. I hate to tell you. Oh, look at this. So... I don't know. There are some websites where versions of this undo partial alloc. Oh, geez. Don't worry about this. Group free. Oh, this is just memory stuff. Anyways. The debugging for assignment three is designed to be very visual, however. Because there's going to be a thing of like, okay, print out the tic-tac-toe board. You hit run and you see what you get. Maybe you're right. You're probably going to be wrong. <laughs> But you can see where you're wrong. So you make some changes, hit run again. Maybe it's better, but not quite there, and so on. So it's designed for you to get used to debugging, but it's designed with in a strategy where it's more visual set to help you with that process. So you may have heard the terrible, terrible assignment three. Don't be intimidated by it. Just go in ready to debug. OK. So lists and loops, we've already been doing this. I've shown it to you a bunch of times. Just like a string, where you can say for each thing in the string, so for each letter in the string, print out the letters. Right? So we've got that like for each loop thing. Right? And just to make sure we're all on the same page, I can say hello, and then for L in ASD, print L. There we go. Hello. Great. So remember, the L variable starts with the first value in that collection of things, which is the string hello. So H. And then the next time you do the loop, it's E. And then the next time it's L, and so on and so on. If I change this, though, to a list, A, B, C, D, E, 
It's the same, like it works the same way for each thing in this collection of things. If it's a string, the collection of things is the letter. If it's a list, it's, well, the contents of the list. So for each thing in that list. The first time it's A. Why? Well, that's the first thing. The next time it'll be B. Why? Well, it's the next thing. Um, and of course, you may remember I in range len. Now if I print out I, what should I see? Don't yell out the answer. Look at this code and think for a second. What should I expect to see printed out? I'll give you 10 seconds to come up with an answer in your head. Raise your hand if you were right. Raise your hand if you were wrong. Be honest. No one was wrong. Okay. But raise your hand if you were wrong, but then look at this and go like, oh, okay. All right, cool, cool, cool. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Right? It's because length of the list will be one, two, three, four, five. But then range means like, okay, zero, one, two, three, four. So I will first be zero. Not five, because it's always up to, but excluding that number. Good save. There's, is there a coffee or anything in there? No. All right, good save. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to skip this silly little example. But here, if you've got your computer, let's do this exercise real quick. I'll give you like four minutes to do it. Write a function, beer on wall, that will print out. N bottles of beer on the wall for all N from 99 down to 1. Right? Range returns a list kind of. Well, I just gave you a big hit. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do this. It's good practice.
Raise your hand if you got it. Raise your hand if you want like just one more minute, you'll totally have it. Okay, cool, keep at it. All right, here's what I have. Raise your hand if at the very least you're like, okay, I know I would need something like that, but the trick is, how do I jump now? Right? That's the trick. Because we've seen range before, but range always counts up. So raise your hand if that applies to you. Like, yeah, I just, how do you count down with range? A bunch of people. For those of you that was asking that question, did you open up Google and say Python range countdown? Because this was the first hit. Start, stop, step. If we want to start at five, go to negative one, but not include negative one, and step by negative one, that'll do the trick. Remember, when in doubt, Google will answer it for you. So, if where do I want to start? Someone yell it. 99. Where do I want to end? Zero, but of course, negative one. Why negative one? Because it always starts at the value you say start at, ends one thing before the value you want to stop at. And what do we want to count by? Negative one. You might say, well, okay, but why can't we just say one? Well, if we put in one, then it will try to count from 99 by ones to negative one. Can you ever get from 99 to negative 1 by adding 1 to 99 a multiple times? No. We have to count by negative ones. Okay, so beer on wall. What? Oh, <laughs> I never said count by negative ones. Why? Because it tried, this loop never ran because I forgot to say count by negative one. The loop never ran because it, by default it wants to count by ones. And while you can't get from 99 to one, so there's, there's nothing there. There we go. 99 all the way down, come on, to no more beer. Oh, zero, yeah, okay, I guess it gets to zero and then says no more beer, okay. Any questions about that one? All right. So we're good. Um, yeah? So when you were there, you said like the 99 negative 1, negative 1. I have mine 99 0 negative 1. Is that what you're saying? It will, but then it won't say 0 beers on wall at the very bottom, which is fine. You know, whatever. That's an edge case. Didn't really matter here. Now, did anyone do it this way? I'm curious. Start at, z okay, we'll go to 99, and then we do n, our n, 99 minus n. Anyone do it that way? One, two, one and a half, kind of? 
Three, cool. For those of you that didn't do it this way, do you know why this works though? Do you know, do, for those of you that didn't do this way, raise your hand if that confuses you. And be honest, because it's good to talk about it if it does. Okay, a couple of people raised their hand, so let's talk about it. Well, remember, when in doubt, what does the code say? That's the trick. So for n in range 99, so in this case, n will go to, and maybe I should have made it 100. So it does get to zero. Perfect. The first time through the loop, everyone's going to yell the answer. The first time through the loop, what value will n have? Zero. That was a very poor everybody. Let's try again. Zero. Perfect. What's 99 minus zero? 99. 99. Great. So then we print out 99 beers on the wall. Next time through the loop, n is what? What's 99 minus 1? Next time through the loop, that is what? What's 99 minus 2? And so on and so on and so on. Remember. So I remember being at this stage learning programming and seeing something like this. My immediate reaction was like, whoa, what? how would I know to do that? At no point would you think like, Oh, I, I learned that one, so I should be put the, I got that in my back pocket, I remember to do that. That's really not the point. The point here is getting comfortable with what can you do? There is nothing stopping me from saying, okay, well 99 minus 7. There's nothing, there's nothing saying I can't do that. But people might be apprehensive of trying something like that because like we haven't seen it before, so can I do that? Of course you can. If it's valid syntax and it makes sense, you hit run, see what it does. When in doubt, remember, the cool thing here is with Python, if you write some code and you're worried about what it's going to do, just hit run, see what it does. There's no harm in that. Sure, maybe some programming languages you can mess up your computer if you start it. But the best part is, all this code is running on Google's computer somewhere else. So even if it's terrible, it won't hurt your computer. You're in great shape. All right. So, okay, we saw this already too. Let's go back here. A, B, C, D, E. Perfect. And s often, like if I just do a for loop, for L in a list, or let's say thing in a list, Print thing. Oop, that's supposed to be an A. There, A, B, C, D, E. When you do it this way, when you do the for loop this way, it only gives you the value in that list. But if I give you the problem, if I ask you, write a loop to tell me if a given letter, is, if a given thing is in that list, great. You can use a loop like this and then just say, okay, is the thing equal to the thing I'm looking for? If it is, great. If not, I'm going to keep looking. So that's our linear search. But if I modify the question to not say, tell me if it's in there or not, if I modify it to say, tell me where it is, tell me which index, and you do your for loop like this, you're at a bit of a loss. Because you can tell me if it's in there, but with just knowing what thing is, I don't, know, I don't know where in the list it is, though. So I'm stuck. So an alternative way to do it is this, the range, -wide, range way. Range of the length of the list. So now, if I print out i, I see 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Great. Those numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, also perfectly correspond with the indices that exist in order in that list. If I look at that list and say, what's at index 0, it's A. 1, B, 2, C, 3, D, 4, E. So now I've got the indices. And if I have the indices, 
I can get the value at any given index. Remember, we can access, if I wrote something like this, print a list at index 1, what would I see printed out? B. B. Great. What if I did something less? This, blah, a var equals 1. If I hit run, what should I see printed out by this? B. Why? Well, because a var is 1. And then a list at a var, which is 1, is b. It's the same thing here. Except I don't want to specify, oh, i is 0, run oic index 0. No, I want to put it in the loop. The first time through the loop, i is what? 0, then 1, then 2, then 3. Well, I can just use i to index the list. So I'll print out i, but alongside it, I will print out a list at index i. So we print out i. If this is throwing you off, don't panic. You're trying to do too much at once. Remember, computer scientists are dumb. We can only do one little thing at a time. So we start with the list grade. We look at the loop. First time through the loop, what value does i have? Zero. Come on, work with me. Remember, apathy is not cool anymore. Sure, it was cool in high school because you didn't know any better. Now you actually have to try. You're tired all the time? I'm more tired than you. I'm a one-year-old. <laughs> so I win. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a competition. You have a question? Did you not just use an anyway? That's what we're going. Spoiler. So in this case here, first time through the loop, I is what? Great. So when I print out. On line 4 it says print out i, we see 0, followed by a list at index i, which is 0, which is a. Then it'll be 1b, 2c, 3d, 4e, and so on. Now, in Python, there's a trick to this too. We can actually even do exactly what you said. We can say, well, Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. Enumerate. Oh, what did I do wrong? An extra parenthesis. There. This is kind of doing the same idea. But when we throw an enumerate there, it says, OK, don't just give me the thing. Give me the index and the thing. The order is index and then thing. I always like to think of it as like, OK, well, I start. Because I always forget, like, OK, wait, which one comes first, the thing or the index? The number or the actual element in the list? And the way I remember it is, well, if I had the index first, I could also get the thing, so that's, not, that's how I remember. But here, the first time through the loop, index is 0, and thing gets assigned to A. So now we don't need to use the indexes. We can. I could go here and write this at i, and it's just, oop, it's because i is not there. There we go. It gets me the same thing, it's just a different way of getting it. Yeah. Would say that again? Oh, you what you're you're saying like what happens if we do this? Yeah. So, okay, this is this is interesting. So we can talk about this, but this isn't something I want you to worry too much about or too much about right now. When you say enumerate, <clears throat> there's a lot going on, but what it actually gives you back is what we call a tuple. Okay, there's two elements there. There could be as much more elements. It's kind of like a list. But we have a pair of values. And we are saying, put this pair of values in this one variable. So to do that, we kind of shove it into a tuple. This one thing that holds two things. To automatically unpack it, we would say, OK, give me the, the two things, like i. 
And I do this, and now we get like the individual things. So if you put two variables, Python's smart enough to take the two values from the tuple and go like, okay, well, you and you go there and there. So that's how it works. Um, if you really want to work with tuples, you can index tuples just like this. And it works as well. But interesting question nonetheless. Okay. All right. Yeah, so enumerate, great. Now, so remember aliasing, right? Let's have a look here. Forget aliasing for one second for this example. Def a, B, all right. This is some pretty silly looking code. But let's look at that. Let's look at it. I define a function called ASD, ASD that takes two parameters. But then immediately in the function, I'm saying, okay, well, the parameter A, whatever value it had, forget it. Just put a, just put it, put a seven in there. Great. Then for whatever value I had for B, whatever, forget it. Just put an 88 in there. That's all this function does. And then now let's let's look at this co code. I create, oops, Q W. Perfect. So I create a variable called Q, give it one, create a variable called W, give it two, and then call ASD, ASD, and pass Q and W. So what value should A get when I run this code? One, and then what value does W get? Great, so now take two seconds, look at this code, and tell me, well think to yourself, and then I'll hit run, you don't have to yell it out loud, think to yourself, what's gonna get printed out? Were you right or wrong? Were you right? Raise your hand. Were you wrong? Raise your hand. Okay. And I know why you were wrong. I know what you were thinking. But here, we got to remember what happens whenever we assign a variable. Parameters are just variables, right? So when I create the variable A for that function, and I'm passing the function the value Q has, so we copy the value Q has into a new variable called A. So then if I modify Q, A is left alone though, because I created a new variable that just copies the value. If this is throwing you off, where's the whiteboard? Right, if I have a variable A, and then B, these get created inside the function. I'm passing the value Q, or the value Q has, which is one, so I've got a Q over here. Got a one, and a W here, that's two. When I call the function with Q and W, I take the value of Q, copy it to A. Take the value of W, copy it to B. Great. Then I say A, B, 7, all right, there. And B, B, 88. Let's see if I can make this A, D, A. Great. But they're left unchanged. Now for the trick. And when I say trick, I shouldn't say that. Now for the test. What happens if we do this with a list, though? Remember, lists are funny. Lists have aliases. So if I were to do something like this with a list, what would you expect to happen? Take a second, think about it. Maybe talk amongst yourselves and c convince yourself of what you might expect. 
And I'll give you a hint. When we copy the contents, if I say, if let's say some variable, I don't care what type it is. If I said B equals A, the computer, Python, is copying over the contents of A and putting it into B, regardless of the type. That's all it's doing. So there's the hint. Now, think about it. Take a second, chat, see if you can figure it out. It's really quiet. Do you all know the answer? If you're really stumped, try it. <coughs> Write some code, see if you can figure out what's going on. Okay, you have an answer in your head? Raise your hand if you're like, okay, I've locked it in. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I've got an idea. Raise your hand if you think, well, here, let's just do it this way. Were you right or wrong? Were you right? Raise your hand. Were you wrong? Raise your hand. Okay, and I know why you're wrong. I know exactly what you're thinking, and you're not wrong for thinking that. But the rules are the same. We copy over the contents of the variable. I have the variable ASD. Nope, ASD. Right? And what's in the variable? Oh, wait, no. Let's start with a list. No, that's better. Of the variable a list. And what's in the variable a list? Is it a list? No. Who said yes? Who said? Someone over here. No one wants to admit it. It was you, wasn't it? What's actually in there? Raise your hand if you're like, uh-oh, because I thought it was a list. <laughs> one person. You're the honest one. Everyone else is lying. So what's in there? If, it's, if you know it's not the list, what's actually in there? Well, that's the contents of the list. Who said that? You? Yes. Raise your hand if you're like, yeah, it's a, it's a reference to a list. Okay, you know this, because this is the whole idea with aliasing, right? So I've got a list somewhere in my computer. Let's say it's here. Zero, one, two, three, whatever, right? And the actual contents of the variable a list is not that list. It's not. The actual contents is the reference that gets me to where this is. So when I come along and call the function, oh, change list, and it has the parameter asd, I copy the contents of a list and put it in the variable asd. So, if I'm doing that, what's the contents of a list? One, two. The, the point here, like the reference to that list. So I copy over that, and that's just an arrow to where the list is. Regardless of which variable name I use, whether it's this alias or that alias, 
If I say a list at index 0 becomes something, or a is d at index 0 becomes something, it's going to modify the same one single list that exists. It's because the contents of these variables, they're not lists. They're references to lists. Remember this. It's going to be very, 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 very important. <coughs> So in this particular scenario, we would say this function has a side effect. Don't worry, this terminology is not on the test type thing. But it has a side effect because typically, if we think about functions, well, we might be thinking of like pure functions. Pure functions are functions you're comfortable with. Those are like the functions you're used to in like math classes. It's when you have a function that just does its thing. And it leaves everything else alone. It does its thing. f of x equals x plus 1. OK, well, then it gives me back, if I give it 2, it gives me back 3. Great. But here, it has a side effect. The function made a change somewhere else. I could do this. I could say add to list 2. If I wrote add to list and took a list and then appended to that list, append, let's actually copy this code and put it in there just to show you. There. Now I appended to that list the word append. A list was modified. It had a side effect. But with slightly different syntax, if I ever say, OK, take a list and then like concatenate it with another list, remember how you can concatenate strings? You can concatenate lists. If I say concatenate, just like strings, it doesn't modify that list. It takes, this, it takes a copy of this list, a copy of that list, and concatenates it. But it leaves the original lists alone. So if I do this instead, add to list two, a list is left alone. This version didn't have a side effect. Now I'm only showing this as an example of like, OK, well, one, you can wouldn't be surprised if you've already done that. And two, I could kind of achieve the same idea. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're doing different things. But if my goal is to get back a list that has something appended to it, and I want to leave the original list alone, well, I would want the one without that side effect. Okay, this I think is just talking about that. Yeah. So there are some programming languages where you're not allowed to have any functions with side effects, which might be good because it might help with like making sure your code's correct. If you know that any function you write won't make any other changes, I'm sure you can imagine if you forgot this was happening, if you forgot this whole alias thing, and you thought you made a copy of the list, and then you modified ASD, great. And then you changed it over here, but you forgot the fact that it's actually going to modify that one single list that's also referenced by the variable A list. That's a side effect. And if you didn't want that to be happening, you have a big problem because later you're like, wait, what the hell? I never changed A list. Well, you never changed A list, but you changed what it was pointing to. So side effects might be exactly what you want. But they might also actually be exactly what you don't want. Anything you can do with the side effect, you can do with a pure version of the function and just write it a little differently. But if you have a programming language where you're not allowed to have side effects, it might protect you from logic errors. So it's kind of neat. OK, what's the next thing? 
So, remember we learned about lists and what types could we put in lists? Could we put an integer in a list? Yeah. Strings? Yeah. Floats? Booleans? Can we put lists in lists? Yeah. yeah? Let's do that. There, and then B equals A, B, A. Print B, let's see what happens. Oh, so there we go, look. Index zero of B is A. Index two of B, is, or index one of B is B. And then index two is, well, that whole list. Now, if you've started to look at assignment two, you'll notice that th this is what we have, right? Like there are lists of lists because each city knows its neighbors, which is represented as a list. So this is pretty cool. Now, if I say B at zero, what does it give me? Yell out the answer. Perfect. And what's the type of A? It's a string. Exactly. That wasn't a trick question. So give me B at 1. What is it? Perfect. And what's the type of B? Uh, what's index 2? In a list. So what's its type? List. Wait a minute. I can index lists, right? I mean, I just did it. So if B at index 2 is a list, how would I index that list? More square brackets. There's no trick to this. If this is a whole list, then I can just go two. So what do you think would be printed out if, I, if we hit run? Two. two. Why? Well, here, let's print out b, b at two, and then b at two, two. So b is the whole thing. b at two is this whole list. And then b at 2 at 2 is 0, 1, 2, this 2. Neat. Now, I want to try one last thing here. a dot append a. Huh. What did I do? Something weird. All right, well, we'll end there.